Welcome everybody to First Christian Church, Disciples of Christ here in Fort Smith, Arkansas. We are glad that you're able to worship with us today. And for those worshiping at home, welcome. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and exalt him with music and psalm. That is from Psalms 95, verses 1 and 2. Let us stand and sing our opening hymn, which is found on page 237 in your hymnal. Celebrations and concerns. If you miss the first Friday summer blockbuster movie night with all the good food that we had, great popcorn by the Moors, fellowship with our church family, it was a super Conanian event. After church today, there is an all church picnic going to be games and a blood drive so if you haven't signed up for the give blood please do so did i say we might have snow cones okay <laughs> i want to thank uh sean and kira moore for the new foosball table down in the youth room thank you guys <laughs> i'd like to draw your attention to the back of the bulletin now for the events of the life of our church Looks like on Tuesday, June 7th, there's going to be a Disciples Women 
board meeting at 10 and 11.30. Wednesday is a youth group, okay? And also the small groups uh, led by Nick is gonna be uh, there also on Wednesday. And then looking ahead, uh, Sunday, June 12th, there's a board meeting. Uh, also at, at 4.30 and at 6, there's gonna be a cabinet meeting. Uh, on June 13th, service at Hope Campus. And then Sunday, June 26th, is gonna be a congregational meeting. Prayers and concerns, let's keep uh, his uh, Musset, Bill Crowder, and Herschel Williams in our prayers. Is there any others that we need to bring forward at this time? Oh, P.S. Happy birthday, Linda. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hey, Grandpa. <laughs> but a quick note with the blood van being here, I do know that some people uh, have an appointment while worship is ongoing. And so if that applies to you, um, first of all, you lucked out this time. Um, but please do go ahead and head on down when it's your time. I don't think anybody's going to be calling us from the sanctuary. And so uh, just keep an eye on the watch and um, head on down that way when it's your time to donate. But we got a good day ahead of us. So let's jump right into uh, hearing some good news. We heard good news already from John Foster. Great news. Any others, birthdays, anniversaries, good news of all kinds. Oh, we got Tim. Yes, sir. Seventh great grandbaby. Amen. Any others? I can't emphasize oh. enough how much good food grilled hamburgers and hot dogs and fixings for chili cheese pony so please come eat after uh worship and play with us for a while mm -hmm. oh yeah we have enough for even teenage boys <laughs> that's impressive oh yeah oh lots of hard work has gone into this picnic and so i think it'll be a, a great time saturday. randy alexander's <laughs> birthday is saturday all right Well, you know, and this was Friday. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, I see where this is going. We, uh, we need to get into the prayer. Oh, one more. Calvin. My aunt's birthday was yesterday. Your aunt's birthday was yesterday? Happy birthday. Amen. Good. All right. Would you all stand and join me in prayer? Let's pray. Almighty and ever-loving God, you know well that we, we often pray for ourselves, for our needs, for comfort, for care from our fears. We often pray and hope for the work that is still needed and the work that we know comes from you alone. But today, this day of Pentecost, we pause. Today we pray for the work you have already done, Today we give thanks for the miraculous work that has already been accomplished. And so hear this prayer of thanks given to you, O God. We give you thanks on this day of Pentecost for you did not leave us alone, but you came to us in the power of the Holy Spirit. God, you breathed life into every one of us here. You found a way to get each person here together as one body, sharing in one spirit. Even as each of us individually had no idea how to find your presence, you found us. God, you refused to let us live alone, all locked up inside ourselves. Instead, you found a way to mold us into your church, the very body of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You have called us into fellowship with this diverse group of people that we might never have encountered if left to our own devices. 
by the work of your spirit, you placed us into a new, uh, a loving family that stretches across the sanctuary, that joins hands and hands with other churches, and which is stre- stitched together with disciples across the entire globe. For this unity, for this love, for this fellowship, this togetherness, this being the body of your son, we give you thanks. We thank you that in the power of the Holy Spirit you have called us together. We give you thanks in the name of the one that we were called into, the one whose image we reflect even now, the one who taught us to pray by saying, Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy name is the kingdom, thou the hell, and the glory forever. Amen. morning. Uh, today again we're, we'll have our second offering for Pentecost. I'd like to share with you how this money is distributed. The Pentecost offering supports new church development, planning, nurturing, and sustaining new congregations part of, as part of the disciples' vision. This offering supports the specialized ministry of new church development through both regional and general programs. Gifts for the program are divided equally between the region in which they are given and the new church ministry. Thank you. Today's scripture lesson comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. It can be found on page 885 in your pew Bible. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were setting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every people under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in their own native language. Amazed and astonished, they ask, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And now it is that we hear each of, each of us in our own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phagia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own language we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? This is the word of God for the people of God.
my soul is satisfied in him alone. Man, I think the uh, first thing to say is that, I don't know if you all noticed, but there were about 20 different vocab terms in that scripture lesson. John Mundy knocked them out. <laughs> well, we are in the uh, third week of our sermon series on the Holy Spirit. If you recall, the first week we looked at the Holy Spirit and his relationship in the Trinity. We saw he is the third person of the Trinity, the one applying Christ-likeness onto us. And what that means is that if you find a church that is led by the Holy Spirit, you aren't just finding a group of good people, you're actually finding the living presence of Jesus Christ as the Holy Spirit continues to grow us into his image. And then last week we looked at the pressing need for us to grow into the Spirit. We looked at what the Bible calls the fruit of the Spirit, as well as the desires of the flesh, and we saw that our collective lives kind of hang in the balance depending on where we lean. If we're all in the Spirit, naturally when we get together, we'll uplift our highest ideals. If we're all in what the Bible calls the flesh, we'll all get together and we'll fall to our lowest common denominators. In other words, our individual spiritual lives all add up. It either makes or breaks the world we live in. Now, as we get into this third week of our series, we are looking to the unity found on the day of Pentecost. And specifically, what we're looking at is the unity found in the Spirit, which stands in contrast to the types of unity that are otherwise offered in our world. See, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but I believe that a lot of the polarization, a lot of the violence, a lot of the just angry bitterness that we've seen in our world lately is not a result of a lot of change. In fact, I would argue that we're, we're seeing a little change. We're seeing mostly a, a stolid state of affairs out that way. But I believe we, we do have a lot of polarization, a lot of anger, a lot of violence in our nation, and I believe a lot of that is simply due to an epidemic of isolation and disunity. People are locked up in their homes prioritizing a, a sad internet-based dynamic rather than the real unity found in the Holy Spirit. But we'll get to that in a moment. First, what, what's especially important to point out on Pentecost is that the gift of the Holy Spirit was not seen as miraculous in and of himself. What I mean by that is you noticed in our scripture reading, it says about one note on the Holy Spirit's presence and about ten notes on his effects. Primarily, the effect that it was pointing us to in our scripture reading was that the Holy Spirit gets us speaking the same language. He unifies us. He makes us one people. But to really understand that miracle, frankly, to really understand the miracle, we do have to do some digging today. And I want us to see that the miracle, the miracle of unification, the miracle of us speaking all the same language, it was a response to a problem way before then. You all may know the story of the Tower of Babel back in Genesis 11. What it is is it's really a, an odd sort of story put before history began, where people got together and they were building a giant tower, and the giant tower was going to stretch all the way up to heaven. It was kind of a symbol of a utopia. Uh, but soon enough, they weren't able to complete it. See, they all started speaking different languages, and the tower fell apart. Now, what that story is not doing, of course, the story of the Tower of Babel, is it is not lamenting 
the fact that other cultures and other languages exist. Just the same, that story, it is not uh, simply a nice explanation for how we got other languages, how we got other cultures. Instead, what that story is doing is it's actually a profound lesson on human nature. It is asking, why haven't humans all gotten together and solved our problems already? Why haven't we built the proverbial tower to heaven? We certainly have the resources. We certainly have the intellect and the strength. If you notice, we're simultaneously talking on the news about the real possibility of us all living on Mars someday. And we're all still trying to figure out how we stop from killing each other. Both of those are ongoing things we're looking at as humans. And so what we have to see is that this, this condition that we've been placed in, uh, that the Bible notes as early as Genesis 11, is still an ongoing one. We still need Pentecost to happen to us here and now. We still need a unity that gets us on the same page so that we can actually build things up. We see that throughout Scripture and throughout our own lives, don't we? You know, that's the underlying idea behind the golden rule, treat others as you want to be treated, that what that is is a call to unity, a call that we would all see each other as one people and one spirit and treat each other like it. We see that's the comfort you find in your family and your friendships, the unity you have with them. That's ultimately the, the hope we have for our world, that we would all unify, that we would all see ourselves as one people, one body, one spirit, and that we would grow together. Just the same that's the lament we have almost always. It comes down to an issue of unity. Some people have a lot and others hardly have anything. That right there is an issue of unity, an issue of people not seeing themselves as one people. Some people hate or murder or steal from one another. That's an issue of unity. Some people are cut off and isolated from others. There you go again, issue of unity. You see, this is really the fundamental issue and the fundamental gift that we have as humans. And just the same, the temptation, we got to note the temptation to make a false unity, a unity that, uh, that is based on who we're keeping out rather than who we get to join in together. It's what gets us into messes of all sorts. Uh, we see in the scripture reading one example of that. We see uh, a whole lot of people who are identifying themselves based on their race or their nation. You may have noticed that it talked about the Parthians. I don't know if you know the Parthians, but their basic deal was they weren't the Egyptians. They didn't speak the same language. You see, we have the Egyptians in the scripture reading, and you know what the big thing with the Egyptians was? They weren't Romans. They didn't speak the same language. And then there was the Romans, and y'all will never guess what the Romans' big thing was. They weren't Parthians or Egyptians. They didn't speak the same language. Do you see all these unifying groups, nations, or races, or whatever else may be that draw us together, but only so long as we're pushing some other people out? It's not a true form of unity. Instead, it's a, it's a unity not based around who we're bringing in, but who we're rebelling against. Do you see the contrast? The Holy Spirit, he offers true unity, true acceptance. You may well have felt his presence here. His presence is the, uh, is the force, the power, that offers us the ability to wholeheartedly welcome people as Christ has welcomed us. That no matter the situation, no matter the condition, people are able to come here and join into a new family, a new community, a great group of people, and that stands, once again, in stark contrast to the partial unities, the closed-off unities that we see so often. Now, Jonathan Haidt, a, a professor of social psychology at NYU, he, he talks about the Tower of Babel, the, the underlying problem that Pentecost addresses, and he notes that this story of humans not finding real unity, but instead fragmenting ourselves off into smaller and smaller groups, you know, it's that is something we're seeing again today. I'm sure you've all sensed that as well, that in the past few years, we've, um, we've become sort of isolated, become a, 
he would argue, a fragmented people. And what I find especially poignant about the article that he wrote is he says that's not really an issue of nationalism or racism or anything else like that. Instead, he's looking upstream and he's saying he believes that a lot of the disunity that we're seeing today is a product of how we engage with social media. Let me share a quote from an article he published in The Atlantic. He writes, The Tower of Babel is about the shattering of all that had seemed solid, the scattering of people who had been a community. It's a metaphor for what is happening not only between red and blue, but within the left and within the right, as well as within universities, companies, professional associations, museums, even families. Babel is a metaphor for what some forms of social media have done to nearly all of the groups and institutions most important to the country's future and to us as a people. See, I know he's a social psychologist, but he, he makes a profound point about biblical theology. What he's saying is that in the last several years, we've seen something of a modern Tower of Babel. At first, social media, it looked like it was going to bring us all together. It was going to provide unity. But what we inevitably have started to see is that social media does offer unity, but it's mostly this closed-off, partial unity. It's unity that only props itself up, that only secures itself by rebelling against others, by pushing against other groups. And it's important that we're clear on that because it, it's important that we know this is not the issue of social media just in general. You know, social media as a technology is actually one of the greatest blessings I think we have as humanity, as humans. The fragmentation is just a result of us using it poorly. You know, I've moved probably 10 times since my childhood, and yet, thanks to social media, I'm able to keep up with people from grade school. That's an amazing gift. Likewise, this is the first time in all of history when just about all of us have in our pockets the ability to contact anyone else on the globe, regardless of distance, regardless of even a language barrier or anything else. Those are pretty huge blessings. Social media it can provide real unity if it's used well. You know, Even right now, thanks to social media, there are people who are not in the room with us who are joining us for worship thanks to our online worship setup. And it's not just that, we, we see just as well that social media, it's what organized the, the Arab Spring back in 2011, got people to be able to connect so that they could rise up against oppression. And that's something that's happening again today. Much to Russia's chagrin, Ukraine is currently still online and still able to organize to push back against oppression. But whether it's small stuff like... Uh, like connecting with old friends, or big stuff like organizing against a totalitarian regime. See, social media has gifts. You know what my favorite gift of social media is? See, because I grew up right in the precipice where uh, it wasn't quite a thing for my early childhood, but by the time I got into my teenage years, it was there. So I've experienced just a little bit of both sides. And you know what I love about it is that it used to be, it used to be, If you were kind of a nerdy kid, if you didn't like what everybody else liked, it was going to be rough. But now, thanks to social media, thanks to the internet, no matter what interest you have, no matter where you're coming from, you can dive right in. You can find a community that just clicks, that speaks your same language. That, to me, is the greatest gift of social media. And I think that's also the greatest curse of social media. Let me say it again. If you have any interests no matter what it might be, you can quickly find a community with that same interest and you can dive right in. You see, I'm sure you all see how that's a double-edged sword. People who were once just dipping a toe into something dangerous are now liable to fall right in. And when they fall in, many forms of social media have these algorithms that prioritize engagement, keeping you involved in it. It's like they get you speaking a language and then they keep you speaking that language. And the result is that extremism and conspiracy theories, which have always existed in one form or another, are now on the rise and thriving at a level we've never seen before. But even outside of conspiracy theories, even outside of overtly dangerous stuff, Jonathan Haidt, he points out that uh, 
there is a disturbing trend that is happening with these algorithm-enforced forms of social media. Points out it's dumbed-down conversations. He calls it institutional stupidity. What seems to be happening, this institutional stupidity that I was gripped by, I think it's naming something really, really powerful that's going on. What seems to be happening is that everyone's found their own personal online clique, the people who speak our language, and we don't really speak to people outside of that group too much. And then what inevitably happens is an issue comes along, it strikes a group of people who all seem to think the same, and then they get very loud, and they start to grandstand and moralize and assume everybody must see things the exact same way we see it. What's happening is we're, we're being tempted to think, due in large part to social media, that we're really doing something whenever we say something controversial online, when we promote this or that pithy statement. Like, think back to any of the polarizing issues we've seen in the past few years. There's no shortage of them, but just pick one. Has much changed from it? We've been polarizing ourselves. We've been getting down to very, very angry arguments that don't actually contain much nuance. They just contain a hashtag or a pithy statement. And then we've been just going off on each other. And what hasn't been happening is much change. What has been happening is that we post about it online, we maybe get into an argument with someone else, and then we just sort of keep trucking. You see, these past several online years, Hyde points out, have been very provocative, but not always very productive. I believe underneath the surface of all of this, what, what's happening is that an increasingly secular culture is looking for an identity. It's looking for a movement. It's looking for something to give them meaning, a, a side of an argument or a line in the sand that will make them feel like they're working for something. They're seeking a sense of unity, but the unity that's easiest to promote on a line the stuff that grabs our attention, it tends not to be nuanced. It tends not to be accepting. It tends to just be a line in the sand to yell about. See, what's going on is that most of the unity that we're being offered on social media and in many forms of uh, the social movements of the day actually have very little content to themselves. They're just empty lines in the sand that are being continually galvanized by pushing against someone else. It's very little to do with the movement itself. It's all about who it's pushing against. Let me give you a silly example, but know this stands true for the more serious ones, too. Like, the legitimately serious social issues that we've seen in the past same years function the same way. But I'm going to give you a, a silly one. In the past several weeks, social media, it's been ablaze with this... Uh, this Johnny Depp, Amber Heard defamation trial. You all know it. You all know it. I heard some laughs from it already. And you all know it's childish and it's nonsense. And I'm sure you all, like me, can't stop watching it. <laughs> Look, I'm not getting into the details on it today, but what we have to see is that people online are unifying. It's another one of those unifying situations. But... What's the unity look like? What the unity looks like is there's Team Amber and there's Team Johnny and they have nothing constructive to say about themselves. Instead, they are just firing off shots at the other side, just back and forth, angry and, and bitter. That's mostly the kind of unity that we're being offered in this, the past several years. Whether it's a silly trial or a pressing social issue, that's how it tends to go, isn't it? You get your in-group, you get your unity, but you only get it because it's grinding an ax against someone else. A little more to it than that. See, it's, it's not a very generative culture, it's mostly a rebellious culture. Social media, it seems to have a way of programming us into forming an identity around which side of the line in the sand we're on. 
We're looking for people who use the same buzzwords as us, who have the same basic ideas as us. It's not too far off from the work the Holy Spirit was doing the first time around to undo the language barriers. We have certainly some language barriers between us today. All of us on social media, we certainly have language barriers. But see, today, amidst a backdrop of folks seeking unity and identity from this or that hashtag, this or that pithy statement, this or that side on the latest controversy, we do have to acknowledge very little is being built up. Very little generative change is occurring from this partial, closed-off form of unity. Mostly, it's just everyone tearing everyone else down. In other words, not much is happening, but we're all provoking and isolating each other nonetheless. And so as that continues, and Jonathan Haidt, who researches this very kind of thing, he, he suggests that we're really only getting started with this kind of angry back-and-forth internet group dynamic that seems to be transferring into the real world all too often. He suggests that while that's occurring, we need to be playing a counteroffensive. We need to be very intentional about our offline communities, our communities that offer real unity, real togetherness, groups that don't fall into attempts at unity that only prop themselves up by grinding an ax on someone else. You know, we need to be deeply formed in communities like our church that offer this real unity, this, this acceptance of you get to be involved, you get to do good with us, you get to be accepted, not have to pass through my 50 different lines in the sand. See, the greatest gift we can offer folks today is this Holy Spirit-infused, dogged devotion to real unity, to embodying the call to being one people, giving folks a, a place where they can flourish, a, a place where they can do good things together, not just draw lines in the sand. Because that simple act of acceptance, of letting people put their guard down and be unified simply because we are one people, it's getting rarer and rarer in our always online world, but that means it's getting more and more beautiful whenever we do it here. So here's the deal. We're going to close up the sermon. We're going to sing our communion hymn. And then we're going to have my own personal favorite part of the worship service where we gather around the table and we share in the, the bread and the cup. That's what unity looks like. That's what the Holy Spirit draws us into. And I hope that we can take that moment from the table with us as we go out because the Holy Spirit is present there. And thing known to us in breaking bread. Three ninety eight. This table, this table right here, the table of Christ beckons us together and receive the blessing and thanksgiving and forgiveness. All are welcome to partake. Let us pray. O oh Lord Almighty,
eternal God. We gather together around your table as one to share this meal of thanksgiving and forgiveness. As we eat the bread and drink from the cup, we remember the sacrifice your son, Jesus Christ, made for us. Bless us, Father, and be with us as we walk in a world of uncertainties. Father, we pray for a long and prosper life, sharing the love you taught us with others. Dear God, hear our prayers. Amen. Lord Jesus, on the night he was to be betrayed, gathered together with the church, both the disciples then and us today, both those there and us here and everyone in between. And he offered to this one people a covenant. It was given to us the breaking of bread. He said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take of it, all of you. Eat of it and do so in remembrance of me. In a similar way, he took the cup after supper. Lifting it up, he gave thanks for it. He blessed it. He said, this cup is a new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sin of many people. Take of it, all of you, drink of it, and do so in remembrance of me. Amen. Would you please rise for the invitation to discipleship? This time, if there are any who feel called to join First Christian Church in membership, if you would please come forward. Seeing none, receive now this benediction. Lord bless you and keep you. Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I like this arrangement.